The conflict between Russia and Ukraine has been raging for almost a decade, claiming thousands of lives and displacing millions of people. From military offensives and political propaganda to international sanctions and humanitarian crisis, this ongoing war has a profound impact on both nations and the world at large. Hey everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest conflicts of the 21st century, the Russia-Ukraine War. So get ready to know how it all started and its impact on the world. This war started in 2014, when Russian troops disguised as locals invaded Crimea, which is a part of Ukraine. The conflict escalated when Russian and Ukrainian proxy forces seized territory in the Donbas region of Ukraine. Over the next seven years, more than 14,000 people lost their lives in fighting in eastern Ukraine. But let's start from the beginning. The roots of the conflict go back to November 2013 when Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych signaled his willingness to sign an association agreement with the European Union. In return, the Europeans demanded that he release opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko from prison and initiate constitutional and legal reforms. However, after a visit with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow, Yanukovych opted not to sign the agreement. Instead, it seemed that Ukraine would commit itself to the Eurasian Economic Union a Russian-led EU analog that would include Kazakhstan and Belarus as members when it came into existence on January 1, 2015. This decision sparked a series of protests on Kiev's maiden Nazalednosti, also known as Independent Square. The protest involved several distinct stages, culminating in the removal of President Yanukovych, which in turn precipitated a violent separatist movement in the eastern regions of the country. The protest started with mainly young people, alerted by social networks and text messages, and they soon established a camp on the Maiden. Although the level of daily participation fluctuated over time, every Sunday, masses converged on the Maiden, with 500,000 people gathering at its peak. The authorities initially deployed the Burkut riot police without serious confrontations. But on the night of November 30th, the order was given to clear the square by force. Dozens were injured in the ultimately ineffective effort, and the protests were re-engineered by the assault. In an effort to preserve his rule, Yanukovych removed Prime Minister Mykola Azarov and offered government posts to opposition leaders Arseniy Yatsenyuk and Vitaly Klitschko, but both declined. As the situation escalated, government forces brought gangs of army men from Kiev to other cities, principally Kharkiv and Donetsk. They burned cars, beat protesters, and kidnapped prominent journalists. On the opposition side, local militias formed, based partly on rightist groups such as the right sector. The average protesters were no longer the 20-something students, but more hardened 30 and 40-year-olds, many from Western Ukraine. Pro-Euromaidan activists took over government buildings in Kiev and throughout Ukraine. On February 18, more than 20 people were killed in clashes with police, but that was only a hint of what was to come. Two days later, the center of Kiev became a battleground. Government snipers fired on protesters from the roofs of buildings, killing at least 80 and wounding hundreds. Amid the chaos, the maiden protesters held their ground. On February 21st, a group of EU foreign ministers arrived in Kiev to broker a deal between Yanukovych and parliamentary opposition leaders. The parties agreed to form a government of national unity within 10 days, implement constitutional reforms to reduce the powers of the presidency, reinstating the constitution of 2004, and hold new presidential elections by December 31st. Yanukovych would remain president until those elections were held. The opposition leaders agreed to the deal, and Putin, in a telephone conversation with US President Barack Obama, appeared to support it. The following day, Yanukovych fled Kiev, and the parliament responded by stripping him of his office, ordering the release of Tymoshenko from prison and appointing Oleksandr Turchinov as acting president. New presidential elections were called for May 25th, but the conflict was far from over. On February 27th, heavily armed troops dubbed Little Green Men for the lack of insignia on their uniforms took over the parliament and government buildings in Simferopol, the capital of the Ukrainian Autonomous Republic of Crimea. After numerous implausible denials by the Kremlin, these gunmen were later confirmed to be Russian personnel. They installed a new prime minister, Sergei Aksoyanov, 
whose party had received only about 4% of the vote in the most recent elections. Members of the self-declared Crimean militia, backed by 25,000 troops and sailors attached to the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, took over government buildings and military installations, forcing the surprised Ukrainian units to surrender. The covert invasion and illegal annexation of Crimea were given a sheen of legitimacy by a widely criticized referendum on March 16th, during which it was reported that more than 95% of voters supported joining the Russian Federation. As the conflict continued, Russian propaganda and the media reached absurd heights. Putin maintained that a pro-Nazi junta had taken power in Ukraine and was targeting Russian speakers. These statements lacked evidence but were repeated at length over subsequent years. In 2022, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Although Russian forces made significant gains in the beginning, Ukrainian defenders fought back and launched counterattacks at Russian positions. This started the war in the Donbas region of Ukraine. As you may remember, this was a Russian proxy war that started with the annexation of Crimea by Russian forces in 2014. Throughout the spring of that year, armed groups took over administrative buildings in Donetsk, Luhansk, and Kharkiv. These separatists held referenda and declared the information of autonomous people's republics in Donetsk and Luhansk. But the separatist movement in Kharkiv didn't go quite as planned. Meanwhile, the conflict between Russian-backed militias and Ukrainian government forces intensified in the Donbas region. Dozens of pro-Russian separatists were killed in a battle over Donetsk International Airport. The Ukrainian presidential election took place on May 25th, and chocolate magnate Petro Poroshenko was elected as president. He promised to step up an anti-terrorist operation, ATO, to regain the occupied territories. However, in separatist regions, new governments were taken over by militants, including some from Russia. One of the most prominent militants was Strelkov, a former colonel with the Russian Federal Security Service, FSB. He established his headquarters in Slovyansk. Strelkov and about 8,000 men established a new base in Donetsk after ATO forces liberated Slovyansk on July 5th. Sadly, units under Strelkov's command were believed to have been responsible for shooting down Malaysia Airlines Flight MH17 near Hrabov on July 17th. The international community increased sanctions on Russia, freezing bank accounts and banning travel by prominent officials in late July. In late August, Regular Russian troops entered Ukraine and surrounded Ukrainian troops at Ilovaisk, where they killed hundreds. Despite overwhelming evidence of direct Russian participation in the conflict, the Kremlin insisted that it was not intervening in Ukraine. After separatist forces opened a new front that once again threatened the key port city of Mariupol, Poroshenko decided to abandon the ATO operation. Representatives from Ukraine, Russia, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, and the two breakaway republics met in Minsk, Belarus, to conclude a ceasefire agreement. Unfortunately, in spite of repeated violations by both sides, the Minsk Protocol remained in place, and by the end of 2014, more than 4,700 people had been killed, and more than 10,000 had been wounded in the fighting. But let's fast forward a bit. In 2015, the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany agreed on a 12-point peace plan, dubbed Minsk II, that proposed the cessation of fighting, the withdrawal of heavy weapons, the release of prisoners, and the removal of foreign troops from Ukrainian territory. The tenuous peace was held, and heavy weapons were pulled back by both sides in early September 2015. Then, in 2019, Ukrainian comedian and actor Volodymyr Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine, in his hit television show, Servant of the People, he portrayed an everyman who followed an unlikely path to the presidency. Life would imitate art as Olensky's anti-corruption platform earned him widespread support, and he defeated Poroshenko in a landslide. Zelensky vowed to bring the conflict in the Donbas to an end, but his efforts were quickly complicated by a political scandal involving the United States. The US Congress had authorized $400 million in military aid for Ukraine, but U.S. President Donald Trump held up the release of the funds, suggesting that the aid would only be released if Zelensky endorsed a pair of unsubstantiated claims about Trump's political opponents. The controversy became known as the Ukraine scandal and eventually led to Trump's impeachment. Despite these political distractions, Zelensky continued to pursue peace negotiations with Russia. In 2019, 
The leaders of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany agreed to hold a summit in Paris to discuss the conflict in the Donbas. This meeting resulted in the signing of the Minsk II Agreement, which proposed a series of measures to end the fighting, including the withdrawal of heavy weapons, the release of prisoners, and the removal of foreign troops from Ukrainian territory. However, the ceasefire remained fragile, and the war in the Donbas continued. The conflict has now entered its ninth year with no end in sight. The toll of the war has been staggering, with over 13,000 people dead and 30,000 wounded. The conflict has also displaced over 1.5 million people, with many of them forced to flee their homes and seek refuge in other parts of Ukraine or in neighboring countries. It was the fall of 2021, and tensions were running high between Ukraine and Russia. In the midst of a global pandemic, the world watched as a military showdown unfolded on the Eastern European border. In September of that year, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky approved a new national security strategy that labeled Russia as an aggressor and identified NATO membership as one of Ukraine's key defense and foreign policy goals. This was a bold move, as previous statements from Kyiv had left significant room for negotiation with Moscow, and Zelensky himself had once harbored hopes for such talks. But Russia was not content to sit idly by. Between October and November 2021, Russian forces began a massive buildup of troops and military equipment along the border with Ukraine. Additional forces were dispatched to Belarus, the Russian-backed separatist enclave of Transnistria in Moldova, and Russian-occupied Crimea. By February 2022, Western defense analysts estimated that as many as 190,000 Russian troops were encircling Ukraine and warned that a Russian invasion was imminent. As tensions continued to escalate, Putin demanded de facto veto power over NATO expansion and the containment of NATO forces in countries that had been members prior to 1997. These proposals were flatly rejected, and British and American intelligence services took the unprecedented step of pre-bunking Russia's manufactured cases belly by revealing classified information about Russia's intentions. But Putin was not deterred. On February 21, 2022, he recognized the independence of the self-proclaimed People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Putin ordered Russian troops into Ukrainian territory as peacemakers, and Russian military activity in the Donbas at last became overt. Western leaders responded by levying a raft of sanctions against Russian financial institutions. The situation quickly spiraled out of control. In the early hours of February 24th, Putin took to the airwaves to announce the beginning of a special military operation. Within minutes, explosions were heard in major cities across Ukraine, and air raid sirens began to sound in Kyiv. Around the world, leaders condemned the unprovoked attack and promised swift and severe sanctions against Russia. The ensuing battle was brutal and devastating. Millions of Ukrainians fled the country as Russia indiscriminately targeted civilian populations with rockets and artillery strikes. But despite the overwhelming odds, Ukraine refused to back down. With the help of foreign aid and their own determined spirit, they fought back against Russian aggression. As the war in Ukraine raged on, the stakes continued to climb higher and higher. Russia, the most heavily sanctioned country in history, found itself increasingly isolated from the international community. Meanwhile, Ukraine became a beacon of hope for democracy, with Western leaders flocking to Kyiv to show their support. Amidst this global conflict, a new type of warfare emerged, the Meme War. The Russian disinformation campaign against Ukraine was met with a barrage of derision from a group of pro-Ukrainian posters on Twitter, known as the North Atlantic Fellas Association, NAFO. These clever internet warriors made use of cartoon Shiba Inu avatars to create a powerful meme campaign against Russian propaganda. The Ukrainian military also gained a valuable weapon in their fight against Russia the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, HIMARS. These American-supplied weapons offered greater accuracy and range than any comparable weapon in the Russian arsenal, and Ukrainian troops quickly put them to use, striking supply depots and command and control centers far behind the front lines. Despite Russia's initial success in capturing the Luhansk Oblast, the tide began to turn against them. Ukrainian forces launched a stunning counterattack on the Kharkiv region, liberating more than 3,400 square miles of territory in just one week. By the time the Ukrainian advance slowed, virtually the entire Kharkiv Oblast had been freed from Russian control, 
the cost of Putin's war was high. The United Nations estimated that the conflict in the Donbas had claimed 14,000 lives between 2014 and 2021, with nearly 40,000 people wounded. An estimated 8 million people fled Ukraine, and nearly that many were internally displaced. The Russian military also carried out the forcible transfer of between 900,000 and 1.6 million Ukrainian citizens to Russian territory. As casualties mounted on both sides, it became clear that the war had taken a heavy toll on Russia's conventional military capability. In less than a year, it was estimated that Russia's ability to project force had been degraded by half. The conflict in Ukraine may have seemed like a distant conflict to some, but its impact was felt around the world. The isolation of Russia, the expansion of NATO, and the emergence of new forms of warfare all served as reminders of the complex and ever-changing nature of modern warfare. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one.